Right, so here uh, I'd like to sort of you know, move into the Japanese sort of side of things. I know that I sort of you know several people who, who are familiar with Japanese sort of you know, high education system, but it's a little bit sort of overview of what's been happening broadly um, in, the, in the Japanese context um, recently. Right, so demographic challenge. Um, the population of 18 year old have been declining. Right, so it was about over 22 two million in um, 1992, or sort of over 20, 20, 25 years ago. And then now it's like almost 1 million, and this, this is predicted to go down 1 million um, in, 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 in coming years. So it's quite, quite deep, sort of you know, kind of declining. And that means there's a kind of fierce competition between the universities. Right, I'll, I'll tell you sort of how, how many universities we have as, as a system. It's quite, it's quite a big sector, but because of the number of sort of you know, declining, the competition is kind of getting fierce, and then that means the tuition fee will go down as well. So that really means a sort of you know, real implication for the university management and sort of you know, survival. So what has been done? Government is trying to increase the number of international students, foreign students. It's a kind of substitute to local Japanese for you know 18 years old. So the, the current target is 300 so thousand foreign students by 2020. And a couple of years ago the government's sort of target was 100,000 foreign students and that, that, that has been achieved right? a couple of years ago. Right? So it's kind of going upwards. So compared to the UK sort of you know number of foreign students this is probably you know is 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 quite small but Gradually, the number of students coming to Japan to study is going up. This is not just university, but also like um, like colleges or like sort of training colleges, more sort of you know specialized um, vocational colleges as well. So it's it's kind of changing because of all this sort of change in the demography as well. So it's, it's it's seen as a challenge, but it's probably a new new opportunity as well. Right. The next challenge is more about finance, right? Well, it's kind of related to the, the demography and sort of, you know, change in the profile of students, but structurally, the Japanese government has got a really, really severe problem of debt. The national debt, this you know, last year, 2016, 250% of GDP is national debt, which means quite severe, you know, debt. That kind of that is affecting the sort of higher education sector as well. So the government sort of, you know, subsidies for both national and private universities are quite constrained because of that. Right? So that's a kind of kind of governmental level constraint. And also the individual students are suffering from high high number of sort of you know loans, debt. And as the student loans really accumulates, it's kind of worry about the default on these student loans, so can they really repay or not? So there's a kind of debt issues at the overall governmental level, university level, and also student loan level. So that's a kind of huge financial issue. So what's been happening as in terms of the sort of reaction to this? Um, the government, the martyr is not that big thing as far well as I understand, but maybe um, the, the, the Japanese colleagues might, might, might add something um, if, um, if possible. But it is likely that there would be more mergers, um, both national, public sector, private universities, because of this situation. A large number of universities, very constrained resource issues. So that's, that's kind of big structural issue. And then in terms of the sort of student finance issue, there's been a sort of changes over the sort of over the last year or so. Um, the government announced at the end of last year a new sort of you know grant in a scholarship so students could keep the money, no need to repay. So that is supposed to help out all the student loan issue. But then again there's the issue of who's gonna get this? The resources are limited, is it only national university students or is it private, you know? Uh, university students. So this is some sort of policy intervention, but there's a kind of huge kind of issue about the equity, whether or not that applies to all universities, or is it only national public university? And then very recently, there was a sort of a debate. Kind of political parties are talking about free higher education, building on the like compulsory education. So at the moment, primary, secondary educations are free of charge, 
And now sort of there's a debate about free higher education, but there's no like kind of answer to where the resources can be found. So lots of talks about finance um, supporting higher education, but in reality, it's, it's really, really difficult. Right, so how be the sector? Um, Japanese system is quite unique because it's quite a mixed system. So we've got national universities and private universities and also public local universities. So national university, public local start from 86, close to 90, and then private universities are really huge, right? So almost 800. So if you think about the UK higher education system, it's like 150 something, what's the number? Um, I don't remember. 57, right? So compared to that, well, Japanese population is probably twice as sort of big as sort of you know UK population, but still the number of universities is like phenomenal. It's, it's, it's really huge. And then if you look at the sort of the government subsidies, I didn't get the number for the public local universities, which are supported by local authorities. In terms of the sort of national government subsidies, it's kind of quite um, not in balance. National universities, which is quite small in number has got most of the money, and that's yen, 1.2 billion yen, and then private universities, which is like almost um, nine times as many, has got much smaller um, subsidies. So that's kind of quite a, quite, quite a sort of um, different there. And overall, with all this number of high education institutions, the gross enrollment, Enrollment at HEs, this includes junior colleges and college of technology and specialty, special, specialized training colleges, not just universities, amounts to nearly 80%. If you only look at universities, probably around 50%, is that right? Yep, so it's really like a kind of almost universal high education system, if you like. So, can this be sustainable as it is? Maybe not in the current form, but that's, that's how it looks like now in terms of the number. So I'm going to look at how it is sort of changing um, and how, it's, how the government is trying to sort of you know, uh, move from, from what it is now to the future shape. Right, so just to sort of, you know, sort of to sum up what, what it has been like, historically the Japanese higher education has been kind of characterized as a collaboration between the public sector and private sectors and most of the private universities has been financed by tuition fees so it's like a sort of student funding the higher education so that has been the case all the way through and all the, all the, all the years after the, the second world war when the sort of the population was growing all the demand for higher education was sort of absorbed by the private higher education. So that's a kind of key role there in terms of providing teaching provision for the growing kind of population in the post-war Japan. And then public funding, both public funding goes to both national universities and private universities and the local authorities support um, public local universities. But in, as, a, as a whole, the public funding goes very much towards top national universities, so that's a very sort of skewed system, right? And then that sort of you know that concentration is accelerating over the last <laughs> ten years or so, which is kind of incredible. Recently, the policy is more and more sort of you know moving towards a differentiation of the system. So it's called like a world class university initiative. Or I'll show it in the in the sort of slide in the. Um, yeah, this one. Yep. Okay. So, so this is just sort of you know give you an overview of what has happened over the last fifteen years or so. Right. So the government is trying to focus on the fewer number of elite universities, if you like. So it started around like two thousand two. Um, the first one is called 21st COE program, Center of Excellence program. That's when sort of government started to pick kind of elite universities. And then then the key change happened in 2004. That's when sort of national universities changed the legal sort of status from kind of pure public national university to semi kind of autonomous entity, which is still sort of publicly subsidized, but they have more freedom to decide what they're going to do. So it's kind of moved 
if you like, closer to British University. It is still public, but there are a number of sort of you know, discretion universities could decide the destiny, if you like. So there's a kind of new governance system, new management sort of mechanism. So, you, so National University was very much, before the 2004, it was very much part of the Ministry of Education remit. It is still the case, but the university now has more sort of own voice on sort of, you know, decision making, governance mechanisms and so forth. So given that change, um, now the still, still the sort of government is kind of defining the destiny of the sector by selecting a number of kind of excellent universities. So that sort of, you know, still continues throughout, throughout these years, global COE program, Global 30 programs, kind of interesting names, and then kind of promoting research universities, and then another global university kind of funding. And then last couple of years, 2016, 2017 is quite interesting because in 2016, the government asked the university to choose their own function, whether like kind of internationally excellent research university or internationally excellent teaching university, or more like kind of sort of supporting local needs. So universities are asked to define themselves by different functions. And then the new sort of addition, which is kind of happening as we speak now, is kind of status of distinguished national university corporations. Which is, which is interesting because it's legally changing. The national university has been treated as sort of the same thing, even if they are sort of, you know, selected for eliteness. But this year, it looks like officially the government will really decide very distinguished national universities as a separate entity. That, that, that really doesn't mean any, any funding. It's more like kind of symbolic status. So, universities could claim to be sort of separate sort of elite system but in terms of resources really doesn't really mean anything so university have to come up with their own resources to match up with distinguished sort of status so what does it really mean i think it's just hard to say maybe um japanese colleagues might sort of comment on that um, later on so this is a kind of sort of differentiation um story um what i'm going to do now Right, so yeah, I kind of look at the differentiation system and I'm going to look at these things later on. Yeah, so here, um, what is happening is as follows. Um, Professor Jeremy is, I think Professor Hannah did a book with him a while ago, right? Uh, uh, about the English University. Yeah, and Japanese University as well, I think. Uh, I, I only consider it. Okay. Okay. Never mind. Okay. So, prof, um, uh, Professor East was a um, he was at the University of Tokyo a while ago, and then he, he's an anthropologist, but he sort of studied higher education, which is quite interesting. And um, he kind of talks about the erosion between the high um, between the national university, private university, and public local universities, which is a kind of interesting point. So the government policy is trying to differentiate national university by picking the elite ones. So some of the national universities are getting kind of quite close with private universities which are more teaching focused. There are sort of elite private universities as well. So there's a kind of lots of sort of layers of universities. So rather than like having a national, private, local, public, sort of legal <coughs> distinction, it's much more <coughs> Uh, complex layers of different sort of universities um, as the sort of you know, governmental differentiation goes on. So that's kind of the, 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 the sort of phenomenon over the last 10, 20 years. And as I sort of mentioned in the sort of the previous slide, the government asks universities to choose from the different sort of you know, status, international, kind of competitive, or um, international, international competitive in some fields or serving local needs. So it's a kind of deliberate sort of you know, differentiation of the status and as university to define their own destiny or function if you like. So that's that's what is happening. And just kind of give you a little bit of sort of you know international landscape. Um, this is kind of a, the the ranking thing. 
And I know ranking is quite sort of you know, problematic, and I'm not really sort of you know into ranking, and there are lots of technical issues. But just sort of give you a little bit of a taste of where things are. Um, University of Tokyo, according to the recent QS for University ranking, is number 34 for by Kyoto and Tokyo Institute of Technology. Okay, so these are kind of research excellent ones. However, overall, what is sort of distinctive in sort of Japanese universities? kind of quite a low ratio of international faculty, low ratio of international student compared to the equivalent of you know, universities, an extremely low outbound exchange student, and kind of lower inward exchange student, but outwards exchange students, Japanese students going abroad is extremely, extremely low. Um, just kind of compare with other universities in Asia. Right, so I kind of, uh, there's a bit of sort of missing um, middle there, but the, in, in, in Asia sort of ranking according to the QS, um, the first five, six is Singapore and Hong Kong and some Chinese, and then Tokyo appears at number 13. And the interesting thing is quite a low ratio of international faculty. If you put the, the top one as 100, University of Tokyo is half and the student, international student ratio is quite low. Um, Tokyo Institute of Technology being a kind of engineering technology university kind of higher international students, but international faculty ratio is quite low. Kyoto University, one of the most distinguished university, quite low international faculty. So that kind of shows us the, the, the kind of nature of Japanese university. In terms of research citation, it's quite, you know, quite good, but in terms of attracting international faculty and students it's much much lower than other um, kind of kind of equivalent in Asia um, region so that sort of probably shows a bit of the characteristic of Japanese university and yeah this is a other ranking things just sort of moving on so what 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 is it then so what um, so I think what's kind of what's what's happening now that, that in terms of the challenge and issue is some kind of gaps between the government objectives and actual institutional capability. So what I'm sort of you know, trying to emphasize is the recent competition and differentiation policy promoted by the government sort of throughout all these years of you know COE or robot something something programs. And this kind of increased competition and so, so much sort of support for certain national universities but then this kind of question of why why the public sort of money goes to very very limited numbers of universities what about you know other universities that are contributing to the sort of teaching of the students you know some private universities are sort of you know quite research oriented so there's a kind of issue of whether it is like a balance or not, so that's one sort of, you know, tension. And higher education institutions, because of all these sort of reforms, particularly for national universities since 2004, legal change, corporatization of universities, universities are developing their own strategies, sort of, you know, sort of own resources, new managers, new intermediary organizational capabilities. However, that's kind of not really matching up with the governmental expectations. The real resources and real sort of you know, autonomy universities have seems to be not really matching up with the government expectation and the sort of kind of pressure for the universities to meet up. So that seems to be the kind of the kind of situation where universities are in, in Japan now. And that sort of seems to be kind of sort of thinking about what's happening in the UK. So that seems to be the sort of no similarity between the UK and Japan. Sort of government incentives and the reality of the institution are not really kind of matched up. This much between the kind of policy societal expectation and the institutional cap capacities to deliver, right? And also external demands, maybe, maybe, maybe it, it could be could be industry, you know, expectations or governmental expectations are reshaping universities without really universities sort of you know, shaping their own capability. And differentiation is happening not just in Japan but in the UK as well. But 
universities are asked to their own, you know, asked to choose their own, you know, functions, status. But is there any room for choice? Isn't it already shaped by the history of the past dependent? There seems to be a kind of isomorphic forces for universities to do the similar thing. But in practice, there's no kind of capacity or no resources for university to develop their own thing. So I think there's a kind of sort of what do you call it? It's it's, it's a dilemma. So the government sort of trying to university to separate you know, their own functions, but in reality, you know, university can't choose because the resources and the capabilities are limited. So that sort of seems to be the, the sort of common common issue, structural sort of issue of in Japan and the UK, as, as I kind of you know see it so far. So, is there any sort of you know policy learning between the UK and Japan? And that's kind of you know, kind of kind of open question. I don't know the answer, and it's kind of interesting to see the different types of universities, different institutional types. In the UK, we always sort of you know look at all the new universities, but the reality is much more complex, right? I mean, new universities have got sort of research excellence as well. So it's not like all universities do research but we kind of tend to have this dichotomy thing. And then there are like a recent newer, you know, actors, like a more sort of you know, market oriented private or you know, foreign university of in the UK. So UK sector is quite diverse. That new sector, as I've been trying to sort of you know, describe here, it's, it's been diverse by, by, by origin, but then there's a kind of mixed up. So how that sort of diversity plays out with different sort of policy incentives. And the sort of similar, similar policy issues, and I think this is where you, um, Japan has learned from the UK sort of higher education policy over the sort of last two decades. It's quite sort of centralized system, yeah? particularly English one and the Japanese one. And UK is more compressed because it's a Scottish and Wales and Northern Ireland as well. But I think it's quite sort of centralized system. And research funding issues, I think Japan is sort of, sort of trying to emulate part of it. And teaching quality issues, um, evaluation sort of mechanism, I think Japan has learned a lot from the UK mechanisms over the last two decades. And sort of something I'm kind of I'm, I'm wondering is sort of the perils of humanities and social sciences. I think in, in Japan there's a lot of talk about how to kind of kind of sustain humanities and social sciences. And in the UK, I don't know whether that's the sort of same issue here. And I think there's always this tension of sort of STEM subject, you know, humanities, social science sort of subject, and that could be something sort of in you know, a common, common, common issue across the two countries. And finally, uh, again about internationalisation, um, it's a bit of sort of messy situation in the UK at the moment because of all the sort of political changes. Um, so far, UK has attracted a number of students and staff. Whether it's going to go continue, we will see. And uh, Japan, um, yeah, it's been trying to attract and retain foreign talents. However, it's, it's a long way to go. I think um, I think it's a, it's a kind of long, long game. And I'm sure, sort of, you know, we will hear more specific talks um, over the next, sort of, you know, um, today and tomorrow. So, right. So, so this is kind of my quick overview of the two systems. I don't know whether sort of it makes sense or sort of you're already sort of familiar with all of this. And in that case, apologies, but just to sort of set the scene. So just kind of as a, as a, as a kind of a number of sort of questions to throw in, in the room um, as, as we're going to sort of talk about these sort of issues over the, over the, over the sort of two days. How are we going to sort of you know, develop high education research? in the UK and Japan. So what are, what, what are the really common research topics? I tried to sort of you know, identify some, but the context is very different. So it's, it's, it's a challenging how, how do we really compare. I mean, I think as we go into the more specific details in the student experiences and you know, other issues in commercialization, I mean, we, we can identify a much more sort of, you know, kind of common framework in a more specific way. <coughs> Have, you know, I think there are sort of you know, experts on international education and comparative education, so this is kind of beyond me really, but there are all sorts of methodological issues and how do we, I mean, how are we going to sort of really look, you know, build, build up sort of data and I think it's a kind of interesting opportunity to 
look at what kind of data we have in common to look at sort of two systems and sort of what are the sort of policy agenda and what are the sort of data. I mean, I, as far as I know, in the UK there are quite a few useful data sets, so it would be really interesting. I mean, do we have something equivalent in Japan to compare? Right? So that's something kind of interesting to look at, and I'm sure, you know, sort of people, there are quite a few people really sort of looking at that, that, that sort of, you know, um, issues, but it, I think this, this sort of, you know, symposium could be, a, could be one of the space to identify the common data sets and what could be sort of you know, added on to the existing ones. And also, you know, two countries doesn't exist in, 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 in vacuum, and the, the Hiroshima Center is looking at Japan and UK and Europe. So what would be the implication of, you know, other, other regions, broader region, UK and Europe, which is a kind of quite tricky situation right now. <laughs> and Japan in Asia, probably, probably uh, less, so, you know, dynamic, but, you know, it's a number also with a sort of students from China, South Korea, you know, sort of Southeast Asia coming over to Japan, learning Japanese, or sort of, you know, bridging the two sort of, you know, the, the countries. So we, we need a kind of broader regional, kind of big, big, big regional perspective. To, to, to look at these countries. And interdisciplinarity of higher education research, I mean, kind of, I come, come from sort of um, mixed, mixed sort of disciplinary research. It's always a sort of challenge for me to identify where I am in terms of sort of researcher. But higher education research is an interesting space where sort of, you know, people could work together, economists, you know, geographers, sociologists, you know, um, legal experts and so forth. So, I think that's kind of you know fruitful sort of you know space for, 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 for all of us. And I think sort of one of the other sort of thing is kind of high education management implications. Um, I know there are lots of sort of you know kind of interest in institutional research and then how that sort of you know research data sets findings will influence the higher education management. So as a researcher, we live in a sort of high education research space. But there are like kind of number of stakeholders in there, and how do we use that data? How do we really work um, with sort of management, sort of you know, interest, and also policy interest, and teaching and learning within the larger organizational context? So it's not purely, as we all know, it's not just purely research agenda, but it's kind of we, we live in a quite complex sort of you know, uh, space with, with, with other stakeholders. Right, so. Um, yeah, what I'm sort of saying here. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I think I'm going to sort of finish into it. Um, yeah, so I think sort of probably this is sort of towards the end of my sort of just opening up, throwing sort of throwing talk. Um, how can we make the international higher education research more visible and impactful? So this is kind of, I'm coming back to the sort of UK heart here. Um, what is the higher education research for? So just kind of a, a bit of sort of a personal view here. Again, sort of beyond the beyond the policy discourse now. I'm working in a business school. Doing a higher education research is a bit of sort of, you know, it's a kind of minority, right? So I don't quite feel like I'm mainstream higher educational researcher, nor I'm a sort of mainstream business school researcher, whatever it means. But then what what is a higher educational research for? And which way, whichever discipline you're based in, higher educational research exists. We have student agenda, we have ref agenda. And we have the institutional agenda, government agenda, or local, you know, economic agenda, and international, you know, policy agenda, including equity issues or research sort of excellence issues. So that's kind of interesting space. So it's not just sort of you know looking at two countries and kind of compare, but I think it's a more granulated sort of you know, context. Each sort of you know. Each researcher has to has to position, and I think that's where what is kind of beyond policy discourse is quite strong, and that's where probably all the sort of knowledge exchange and policy learning will benefit, sort of you know, from. And yes, patient bit with stakeholders already mentioned, and yeah, there's a number of three issues like you know economic development issues, innovation issues. I kind of work on at the business school, sort of you know, um, academic. What are all these sort of policies like SAD mission or you know university doing all this knowledge exchange with businesses? Is it really healthy thing? I mean, it's kind of short term in a way. It's a good thing, but there's always a trade-off. 
is a government intervention really helping the research in the long term? So that's a kind of tricky issue, but as, a, as an academic, we have to sort of balance it in the short term, mid term, and long term.